Jane, thanks for making time to talk to me today. Talking uh, just now with Jane Ashton, who's Sustainability Director at EasyJet. Many of you will know that she's had a long history of work in travel and tourism. I've known Jane for years. One of the most forward thinking people I know in the industry. Jane, I'm really keen to hear from you where you think we're gonna go on aviation. You and I both know that travel and tourism is important to people's livelihoods and to making the world a better place. And I'm really worried that the, the issues over carbon are gonna restrain aviation in the future. How do you see it? Are you more optimistic than me? Well, I absolutely agree with you that travel and tourism is absolutely fundamental to uh, to employment, to prosperity, to um, economic progress um, across the world, and employees, as you know, um, you know, ten percent of, of global employment and, and GDP um, uh, follow back to to travel and tourism. So um, it's absolutely fundamental, and people are going to continue to fly um, whilst uh, environmental consciousness is rising, and we've seen it rise and rise throughout the pandemic. Um, but uh, in terms of um, people not wanting to fly anymore, I, I don't see that as an option. Aviation is going to continue um, and there's going to be ever more demand for it globally. So it's absolutely imperative that we rise to the challenge of decarbonising aviation as quickly as possible. Um, and obviously, aviation has got specific challenges in that, in that respect. It's one of the hardest to abate um, uh, industry sectors. Um, however, there are pathways through a uh, forward and, and that's that's really encouraging to see now. We can see a way forward, particularly for short haul aviation um, uh, over the next uh, over the next decades. Where do you see hydrogen in that chain? I see that as a fundamental enabler um, from the from the 2035s onwards um, that for, for short haul aircraft, um, that's going to be um, a, a, a dis distinct possibility for narrow bodied aircraft. Um, so um, we're very, very focused um, on uh, working with, with government and with academic institutions and with a range of partners, um, particularly um, partners such as Airbus, um, to help make that a reality. Do you think that the that, that will cope with the growth in demand? Because it seems to be the only fuel that can cope with growth in aviation will be hydrogen. The other opportunities may maybe things along the way, but the fundamental game changer has to be hydrogen, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it, it, it does. And, and uh, the great thing about hydrogen is that it's, you know, it, it's ubiquitous. It will be used for many different um, uh, 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 sectors of the economy. Um, and, and that's sort of a differentiator with sustainable aviation fuels, which uh, although, uh, you know, um, a very, very promising uh, and fantastic interim step um, is still uh, bespoke to uh, aviation um, and, and therefore ultimately not as scalable um, as, as hydrogen technology um, promises to be. And of course, you know, we, we, the world needs to decarbonize um, faster than the mid 2030s when hydrogen um, is likely to become scalable. So there's lots that we're doing right here and now uh, and over the next uh, 10, 15 years uh, to decarbonize in advance of hydrogen uh, technology and hydrogen infrastructure uh, coming on stream. And there's lots that, that, that uh, um, governments, um, uh, industry bodies, uh, technology providers need to do to actually ensure that um, the infrastructure and the technology um, is there and can, main, and, can, and can scale in time. Thanks, Jane. Can we just, um, just very briefly perhaps touch on this issue of, of short haul? Because it seems to me that Virtually everything that EasyJet does falls into that category, doesn't it? You don't you don't fly long haul. Um, no, no, we don't. We have an average um, sector length of of, of uh, eleven to twelve hundred miles. Yeah, which means that all of that holiday making that you do, all that leisure travel, and you do quite a lot of business travel too, all of that would effectively be hydrogen powered at some point by twenty forty, certainly on some kind of taper running from 2030 or 2035. That's a massive change in the aviation um, infrastructure, isn't it? 
Yes, absolutely. And it's definitely not going to happen overnight. Um, so we're doing lots of work, um, as you can imagine, with our, our strategy department to look at what that transition will look like. Um, so transitioning um, the fleet uh, now, as we have been for several years, to the um, the NEO family um, of, of aircraft, the, um, uh, the A320s, A321s, um, and uh, increasingly doing so over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, and then transitioning to the uh, hydrogen propulsion um, aircraft, so either hydrogen combustion um, fuel cell <clears throat> or most probably a, a hybrid of both um, over the, the subsequent 15 years through to, to 2050. Um, and, uh, and, and yes, even then, we know we've, we're, we're focused on getting as close to uh, zero emissions as possible by 2050. Um, the realities of fleet replacement will mean that there's, um, you know, that that that, that probably will uh, bleed into the 2050s before we completely um, uh, uh, zero carbon. Uh, and there are there are lots of dependencies and lots of players that will. Uh, be required to help bring that about. I mean, one of the um, one of the sort of most immediate things over the next um, 10 to 15 years is the uh, single European skies and air traffic management, which um, has got a target uh, of up to 11% um, carbon saving that could be achieved through um, through 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 uh, optimization of um, of air traffic management. Be fantastic for passengers not to have to sit on the tarmac waiting to take off um, in the future. I think that's a really exciting prospect in terms of the quality of the experience for the passengers as well, not to mention the crews. Just one last question, if I may, Jane. Um, you know that I'm passionate about the Gambia, and, and I think that's probably just outside your range, but it's not just the Gambia. One of the things that hydrogen is going to do is to level the playing field for those countries which are able to produce fuel which the airlines can then buy from them rather than having to import kerosene to sell on to the airlines. That's going to be quite a game changer. And what's happened in Tenerife with sea fuel and the, and the production of hydrogen there for fleet hire cars is, I think, a sign of what's going to be quite possible moving forward into the second half of this century. Yeah, no, I mean, Absolutely. Um, countries making um, significant investments in, in renewable energy uh, to support the creation of green hydrogen um, will definitely have the opportunity to be, to be winners in, in, in this sphere. So, um, so yes, on a kind of levelling up agenda worldwide, it'd be, be fantastic um, to, to see that becoming a reality. Um, so there's, as I say, there's lots of lots of different players uh, and particularly governments that need to, to be involved in helping make that a reality. Jane, as I said to you in the green room before we started to record this, I was hoping for an optimistic interview today. Thank you for delivering it. I think what's happening at EasyJet and other places around the hydrogen agenda is really exciting um, and we all need to get behind it and support it. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Harold.